welcome to the Florida Native Plant Society's Lunch and Learn series. Today we have an exciting and useful uh, presentation on rain gardens, on creating a rain garden, what rain gardens, uh, what the purpose of rain gardens, and what plant native plant species to use in a rain garden. And we are, we will be presented today, um, we will be Barbara McAdam will be presenting this today, this presentation. She is a um, urban horticultural agent with the Miami-Dade U.S. IFAS Extension Office. And Barbara, why don't you in tell us a little bit about yourself before you get started on your talk? Okay, well, thanks for the promotion. Um, I'm actually not an agent. I'm a, a program specialist. Uh, Laura Vasquez is the agent in charge of our program but specialist in the fact that um, through the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Program and Florida Friendly Landscaping, and you'll see in the next slide, we're funded by Miami-Dade County Water and Sewer and several other folks. Um, we become, our team has become specialist in water conservation and then covered under the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping, right plant, right place is the cornerstone and I love native plants. They're quite often the best right plant for the right place for our landscape. And you'll see how this is going to work into those aquatic plants, uh, aquatic edge plants for your rain garden. So do you want me to keep going? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It's, take okay. it away. <laughs> All right, so um, we are funded by many, many sources, um, starting with the USDA uh, Farm Bill, which provides funds for the University of Florida, the land grant college in um, the state of Florida, um, U University of Florida and Florida um, A&M. So um, Primarily, we're funded by Miami-Dade Water and Sewer to do water conservation. We do an irrigation um, assessment program to, for those folks that are using irrigation because a lot of water is wasted through that outside irrigation. So we're helping them to look at how, how and what they're watering. And the Department of Environmental Resource Management, that is the guardian of our, our natural resources, Solid Waste funds us to do composting workshops each month. And we have free composters for Miami-Dade County uh, folks. And we work through uh, the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Open Spaces, where within the eco division, these parks include natural areas and love working with the Environmentally Dangered Lands Program and the Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience. Whew, sorry. <laughs> we wear a lot of hats and there's monthly reports and we copy everybody. So um, first, let's just take a quick look at Florida Friendly Landscaping, nine principles because this is this was created over almost 30 years now as a guideline to sort of, you know, take folks back into what we really should be looking at and doing in our landscapes. I think a lot of folks had lost touch with what to do in their outdoor environment. So it's these nine principles and uh, you'll find these same principles are talked about throughout the United States and also the world. At one point, Kew Gardens, um, Her Royal, uh, Her Majesty's Royal Botanic Garden in England had seven principles very similar to this. But the entire program was designed and created to primarily, and it's not advancing, don't tell me I got a slide stick. There you go. Um, it's, it's to protect and preserve the the quality of our water resources. And we do this in all areas, uh, residential for new development, and also for those folks that are out there um, that are maintaining landscapes, whether they're uh, municipal or they're your guy who comes and takes care of your lawn, um, and the, or they work for parks. So everybody um, gets a chance to learn this and the Green Industries Best Management Program also uh, provides CEUs. So that's just the umbrella there. Sorry, this comes up often. And I would like to say that 
if we had been following uh, Florida friendly landscaping principles, I don't think we would see quite so many fertilizer ordinances that are needed being needed to be put in place to curb the problems and issues with uh, too much excessive fertilizer use. So this is a, a, a great little look at a Florida friendly landscape. And you can see how plants are grouped according to their water needs. You have trees that are providing shade to cool you from the heat of the day. They're on water, lucky them. And so they've got a buffer zone here. And of course your best plants for that are native, right? And they've got a nice small little rain garden here as that water kind of flows down before it gets into this body of water. So a lot of interesting things to look here and I'm happy to share this with everybody afterwards and hopefully I'll, I'll be online to answer questions. But this is throughout the entire state of Florida in every county. So taking a look at um, some of the things You'll see a little bit, I'll explain a little bit about the perfect storm that that drew me to this, but I'm always reading, um, you know, messages and, and uh, different information about water conservation. EPA is one of my go-to sources, and they've had this soak up the rain program in New England for, I think it's between five and eight years now. It, it looks like they responded to issues when they had um, big events like Hurricane Sandy and they started becoming aware that they were, were having these intense flooding issues during more frequent storms. And that area seems to tends to be getting hit more with storms. Actually, statistically, it is um, shown that hurricanes have been kind of traveling up that pathway. So this was a great source, but you'll find a lot of um, information on what is being done in New England. It's about time we got some things on this website. So nine principles, a shout out to Florida Department of Environmental Protection. We celebrated our uh, 28th anniversary this year. And this whole program, uh, well, it was last year. We're gonna be 30 next year. This all started on a $75,000 grant from DEP. So that's just a little bit of um, information about that. And it was just a matter of recognizing where non-point source pollution was coming from, primarily from the cumulative effects of what we do in our home landscapes. We make a difference. We make a negative impact, but now that we know, we can make a positive impact. So a little bit about the, the rainfall patterns here in South Florida. And interesting to note, but um, this is ha actually happening all over the world. It's kind of like a feast or famine situation where we have lots of rainfall, just, you know, rains really hard and a lot um, inches of rain um, within a short tom time frame, or we are, <laughs> Where is the rain? We're in what I call the heart of the rainy season, which is those months that we're starting to get into that March, April, May, for us down here in South Florida, before rainy season kicks in. Days have gotten a little bit longer. They've gotten significantly longer and the temperatures are higher. We bump into 90 degree temperatures. It seems earlier and earlier every year. Last year, we touched 90 degrees for a brief period in February, but we were consistently getting some temperatures in the 90 degree range during the month of March. This is really stressful for everything out there in the landscape. And it will tell you immediately whether you've got a plant in the right place or not, because you'll start to see wilting under these conditions. Who knows in the future if this is going to progress into more extreme, drought situations, but this is a trend. Sorry, folks, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we should be getting ready for this. Be prepared. So even into June, into rainy season last year, we still had some little areas of drought hanging on, hanging on moderate drought here in Miami-Dade County. That's where I am, by the way, all the way down here. <laughs> um, 
and I monitor several sources. I'm always on the U.S. drought monitor map. As we get into those months, I'll just be like biting my fingernails, especially as my rain barrels at home start to get empty. Um, and we're not as bad as other areas. Of course, we have just prolonged drought here in um, the Southwest, but you should note that over the winter, which is their wet season, they had some flooding rainfall events. So again, the feast or famine um, or, you know, flood or, or drought. So a lot of things can happen during this that are not good. And one of the issues is during that dry season, anything that gets used in the landscape is just sitting there. And when we get those first heavy rainfalls uh, with the start of rainy season, that can wash across your landscape, across hard surfaces, and find their way to bodies of water and take all of those chemicals um, and any pollutants that are on hard surfaces, they can take that to the nearest body of water, which for us down here, um, you'll see uh, where everything just led to Biscayne Bay and led to a really difficult situation that brought uh, this issues, these issues to our attention in a huge way. So this was the first year of COVID lockdown uh, 2020, working from home, and I'm seeing my home landscape every day in March when we went into lockdown, and it's getting crispy out there. This is my native salvia coccinea, not getting any water, and it's just drying up and, and going to dust. No worries, because it will seed and come back, but I decided to do several blogs. This is a time when you should be wait, waiting for rainy season. Now it's the time to plan and what to look for in moderate drought. This ended up being the second worst um, dry season, low, you know, lowest rainfall dry season um, that we've recorded so far. Uh, but you can see my rain barrel was getting low there. Um, so it was was getting a little hmm. oh that's file and note of flora right there yes i wanted to make sure that was growing healthy so extreme events i won't just keep pounding on this but they are happening and i don't think you can watch the nightly news without seeing an example of this somewhere on the planet so let's go to the perfect storm scenario Hmm, sorry, it's not really perfect in a good sense, but I think we all remember the red tide events that we really started to see just huge amounts of fish. In 2015, we saw whales, we saw turtles, um, we just saw all of this life from the sea just on the beaches on the west coast of Florida. Um, and this was the beginning of something that has is not really stopped. And red tide is, has happened in our past. It, it is also can it's somewhat of a naturally occurring um, phenomenon, but it is increasing because of what is running off into um, into the Gulf of Mexico. So. Following that, the next year, we had the blue-green uh, cyanobacteria, the algae, the toxic algae in, um, on the East Coast. And that was just a, you couldn't get near the sludge. Uh, your eyes would burn. You didn't want to touch it. And this was extremely devastating and extremely concerning also. We have to remember, what's our main source of income down here? tourism, right? People love to come here because we have this beautiful environment, but what, what's happening to this environment? So people started paying attention, I think, when they realized that this is not just something that is harming other living things out there, but it is going to hit us in our, our pocketbooks as well. It's our livelihood. So also what happened that year of 2020, I got finally my chance to go to the University of Florida's Water Institute um, Symposium. 
That was in right before lockdown. Thank goodness I didn't catch anything early. And um, there's my parking pass. And I loved it. I finally got to go up to the campus, the big G, Gainesville. So this was the, um, the agenda for this that year. And it's happening again this year. But you can see this was all about blue-green algae, all of these issues that we had been seeing, uh, water scarcity, impacts and contaminants. Um, and sad to know that even our springs are contaminated by what seeps through. I'm always hyper aware of what is going to um, wash through our very washed through to our very shallow Biscayne aquifer here. And I know that it can it can run dry in and or get very close to being at sea level. So this was a chance to look at this all over the state with some guest speakers from other areas. Dr. Hans Peril, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name from um, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We need water. So his talk, um, I remember clearly this slide because I started following this, but he was looking at um, an area in the Pacific and asking, is this, um, is this foretelling what the future is? And it turns out that it is, unfortunately. We have these uh, cyano, uh, blue-green toxic cyanoalgal outbreaks all over the world where we have just impaired waters everywhere. And um, there's, it's a huge problem, but the good news is that there is a lot that we can do about it. So I come back from, um, from all of this information overload at the um, Water Institute Symposium. I mean, I was just, I felt like my brain was, was struggling to take it all in, but it, it took and plus they made all of the presentations available and I took pages of notes and I'm like, ah, my brain's on fire. And then August, we have this in Biscayne Bay right here in our own backyard. And, you know, now we have a website, we have a uh, chief bay officer, we have Biscayne Bay Commission. And we realized we don't have a B map. Folks didn't even know what a B map was. It's looking at the nutrients and what is in the water. And it looks at also, we're specific down here. We're of course unique. So we need, Biscayne Bay needs its own specific B map of what this unique environment of the bay needs to stay healthy. All of that, is done or in the works and everybody's pulling. Now, you know, like the proverbial sled dogs and the harness, let's go. We can, we can do something about this. And some of the things could be low hanging fruit, like what you do in your own backyard. Others are going to be way more expensive, like converting septic to, to municipal sewage um, connections. So again, a round of logs. Um, protecting Biscayne Bay series. I just listed out what do we need to talk about and I had the advantage of looking at some of our publications and having just come back from this symposium and um, just writing articles and just getting that information out there and I was speaking with Valerie before we started um, when we went to COVID lockdown we had to work through off the gator cloud and we all transitioned to doing these presentations through teams rather than zoom which we might be more familiar with but zoom because of the program they created with university of florida had a the capability of reaching 10,000 people and i was like please yes 10,000 people it's yet to happen we've yet to get more than 300 people but you know, we have, what, 2.7 million people here in Miami-Dade County. So I'll just keep talking and doing it over and over again. And I thank you for the opportunity to talk again today. So this has not gone away. 
the red tides and the blue green algal um, and fish die offs have not stopped. So they're just sometimes they're less. And when they get really big, it's going to break through into local media. But those of us in the environmental um, arena are hearing about them. They're week through weekly reports and we follow it. And of course, in a perfect world, we would all be building new construction using low impact development practices. This is just from the university, um, the Department of Ecology, State of Washington, sorry. And it's talking about buyer retention, rain gardens, permeable pavements, so not hard surfaces that you know don't allow the rain to percolate through to the ground. And just an interesting fact that the majority of us all get our drinking water from aquifers. We're not pulling it out of the streams or rivers or out of the ocean. Um, it's, it's aquifer water. I'll be doing that rain barrel workshop tonight. So all of these methods, and this is coming up time and time again. Here's Utah, lovely development. Uh, they've disconnected the hard surfaces, so there's not a continuous path for this polluted stormwater to run off on. And, you know, another, here you go, rain barrels, yay, uh, grassy swales, uh, rain gardens. It's, it's over and over again, the same information, green, um, greenways and blueways. So these are simple practices. And the the aim of all of this is to get as close to zero on rainwater that runs off of your, your property or, you know, your home or your park or your business, um, your church, all of those places. Um, we want to make sure that we keep that, that rainwater, let it recharge our water resources, because when it moves over these hard surfaces, it's going to pick up pollutants and it's going to travel to the nearest water body. So I'm not going to belabor this. You know, this is this is my soapbox. <laughs> um, it's so easy. We have the solutions. We just need to change how we're doing things. Yes. And of course, this is talking about new development. What do you do when we have these already dense, uh, densely developed um, urban areas? That's a whole different uh, animal. That's a horse of a different color. So there you go. We want to mimic the natural water cycle. We don't want to mess with that natural water cycle after all, because that has taken millions of thousands of years, sorry, to develop. Um, and it works perfectly in sync with the plant life and the animal life. When we go in, um, then we upset that balance and we can create issues where we don't have the plants that are taking up those nutrients and those nutrients are going to end up accumulating down the line. I think it's pretty kind of hopefully you got it a little simplified. So one of the things that the Office of Resilience started looking at and was this um, Arcola Lakes area and this was already a grant project um, that the department of parks recreation and open spaces had gotten grant funds for um, this area you can see the little river here it continues and empties out into biscayne bay and that whole area along the, the bay is some of the most degraded water where we saw a a lot of dead fish and it's also an area that was built a long time ago one of the first areas developed in miami and um it has septic systems so we're looking at what we can do to make sure that water along this uh little ri little river excuse me doesn't end up flowing off of all these hard surfaces um, in the in the to the west, or as we would call this, the upstream um, situation. So, what can we do in this area? So, Arcola Lakes was selected because you can see this low lying um, area. This used to be part of the Everglades, 
and it was a slough, which would be a low-lying area, kind of wet um, for definitely for the rainy season. And pretty much a lot of the year, this would have been, these areas in blue would have been wet and swampy. So this is a look at the park. Here's the bioswale that Miami-Dade County Parks Recreation and Open Spaces had contracted to be constructed. And our part in this, there were many partners in this, including Million Trees Miami. Plants, uh, trees were selected that would um, survive in, in those moist, wet conditions and planted along this area. And they were like all native, yay. Um, but we looked at the budget and thought we had done the rain barrel workshops and we knew we wanted to, to do rain barrel workshops again. We ended up being able to provide a total of 50 free rain barrels for the community so they could also help prevent that water from being run off and use it in their gardens. And we also got to give away plants to them, which was super cool. Um, but what else could we do with the funds that we had left and this program, which was started before COVID in 2018, boy, now it was like uh, we found a window where we could do this in 2021, but it was like, your deadline is in three months. <laughs> so let's come up with some ideas of what we can do and how we're going to do it. And I kind of maybe overstuffed the amount of things that we were going to try to do here. But I thought, gee, with that much money, I think we could make a rain garden here. And we could have a demonstration and show how a rain garden would work in this situation. So went to playing. I don't know CAD and I don't have that program. So I use little shapes in PowerPoint. Um, and I made a legend and then I made an Excel sheet and which, you know, just covered everything we would need and we could do it within the budget. Now note here, Mexican um, Alavadoa tree, I exchanged that for Dahoon Holly. Dahoon Holly likes wet conditions, but if you can see, probably not too well, and we'll cover these plants, um, but these were all natives and they needed to be. So looking at the site, there's Dalton, Stacy, um, Oh, I'm going to forget names. I knew I would. Laura, uh, that's Linda behind here. We had this core team and we brought in staff from Arcola Lakes to do the groundwork two days before we had an excavator there. This was the original location, but they're doing some work here. So I couldn't use this beautiful little depressed area. I had a hump here. And so now I needed to come over here and excavate this a little so I could try to stop it from going here or onto the sidewalk. So you can see that in the background. Maybe when they finish here, we can expand the rain garden and go here. So this is pretty much the fledgling rain garden, which got put in in September, which is late for us in our rainy season. So this is being watched. They do have a hose in case they need to haul something out there um, because we weren't able to, originally we wanted to capture rain off of this roof so that we could use the rainwater in case we got really dry. So we're watching this and seeing how it goes. And that's just a, a look at one of the crews, this was the final day of installation. Um, this is the Conservation Corps dedicated group of volunteers um, that works with parks coming in and doing the what plants were not planted yet and adding in the pea rock and putting pavers around so you could have a path through. This structure right here is um, meant to be covered by the, um, the uh, passion flower vine. I wanted to do a little walkover bridge here, but we didn't quite have the funds for it. So maybe um, I might have to DIY build something if that isn't covered yet. So 
We also were able to go to the bioswale. This is how the bioswale looked when they first installed it or during installation. That is a weed barrier, not, um, not a, a surface. Water can still percolate through that is what I'm trying to say. Uh, covered with rock. And of course, you know, what, what happens to native plants and our, and our landscape plants after a while, we have brown leaves. So rather than coming in and just kind of like, you know, cutting these things off, uh, like they, you see uh, Fakahati grass trimmed all the time, the Conservation Corps got in there with clippers and cut the dead leaves and the old uh, flower shoots because this kind of dies back once it blooms, but it re-sprouts up from the bottom with new shoots. So it's a little bit of maintenance. And, you know, we don't always have time for that hands-on touch. I enjoy that in my garden. I'm out there, the birds will be everywhere and the butterflies. So that's my Saturday morning if I'm not doing outreach, is communing with nature in my garden. So there's the group strong and we were able to we had funds also to do a pop-up banner and uh, a series of um, mounted posters that explained the project and we were able to purchase plants to share with the volunteers that came so I think it was a good thing fingers crossed it doesn't get too dry and I'll be at up there in a couple of weeks because our next project is to do a community garden for the senior center there. So I'll be checking that um, rain garden. I mean, yes, rain garden. So rain gardens, let's go. First of all, bioswales, rain gardens, all of these features except for a pond um, are meant to only hold water um, to allow it to, to be retained there for a 72 hour period. So it's not gonna be standing long enough to breed mosquitoes. But I just want to give this reminder because we have so many diseases that are mosquito borne. And now here in South Florida, we have four species of the Aedes mosquitoes which vector these diseases. So we do pay huge attention to not leaving water open to, um, to facilitate breeding mosquitoes. Never ever. Um, it's unpleasant to be bitten and you could be, um, that you could, somebody in the neighborhood could have one of these diseases and then you have it next. So this is a beautiful drawing that was off of the webpage of EPA. It's not attributed to anyone because I'd like to uh, note the, whoever made this beautiful drawing. And this shows a little bit of details here. Not all of these are necessary, depending on where you are. Um, they added a prepared soil mixture. I'm one of those people that follows that mantra of do not amend the soil. And here in South Florida, um, just excavating and just, or selecting a point where you have that low point and you'll see my rain garden in a few minutes. I, I couldn't excavate it because it's, it's on rock and our rocky uh, soils down here being so close to the aquifer um, that we don't need anything else to make the water more permeable, uh, the soil more permeable here. I think this is more for, for folks who have clay and things like that. So remember this probably originated for the New England area. And outlet to um, pipe to outlet, optional, um, but an overflow optional. And how you direct the water here, that is another um, thing to look at because the rain falls off of my roof. I don't have this long path, I have a side path. So I'm pretty close to um, this same type of, of uh, diagram. And one thing I want you to note is the way they depicted the roots of the native plants is absolutely spot on because for the rain garden at Arcola Lakes and for my own rain garden at home, I um, unpotted uh, pickerel weed that had been growing in a tall container. It was growing in a, in a big uh, aluminum livestock bin and 
I had to just actually end up turning it on its side and struggling to get those out because just in the period of about three or four years of having that as a, you know, a little, little uh, wet garden feature, it was just all these fine roots. So it really was just roots all through that soil, getting all of the nutrients that it could get out of that. So they are, the, the native plants do their job with taking up those extra nitrogen and, and other chemicals that are often really good for the plant. So there you go. So this is how it started. Pretty pathetic, right? <laughs> Most people look at this and laugh. And I made a terrible mistake here. I'm gonna to have to speed up because we want time for questions. But I had planted a um, chocolate ruffle aurelia here and, um, and it grew beautifully, but it got knocked over during Hurricane Wilma and it just created this, couldn't see through it, which was fine. I didn't have to close my curtains at night and I could watch the migratory warblers in there picking at the insects but after a while it was like this is looking pretty pathetic and I started collecting plants from connect to protect which is part of Fairchild's um, program here to uh, expand pine rockland habitat and I thought this might be a good spot but not because it's too wet for pine rockland and you know, my little non-natives here, uh, I follow the golden rule. Uh, plants shall do no harm, meaning they should not be invasive. And I add a further caveat to my own garden is that plants should provide. They should provide something for wildlife, for the common good of the landscape, or they can simply be drop dead gorgeous and feed their, your soul with their beauty as long as they're not invasive. So I've made a few mistakes and I'm correcting them. And more and more, it's native, native, native for about 25 years now. So this is the old house. It's gonna be a hundred years old. And I created this on PowerPoint. And there's the roof, roof peak. This is the garage. This is the area um, that you saw here. So there you go, looking pretty sad. Um, I'm not in control of how often my grass gets cut that's done by the park. Um, and this is during rainy season, or it's actually, this is October. This is a, a late uh, rain event. And I'm starting to look at, well, let me clear, after I cleared this out, just removing, I thought a few more weeds, <laughs> right. Um, well, a few more, it progresses along the way, moving things around. The more you get out there and play, the more you see. Um, did I have a plan? Yes, I did. And it's still following the plan, but I kind of, sometimes I'll rearrange the furniture in my house because I like this there better. I used to be an interior designer. I think I've naturally just gravitated towards that kind of stuff my whole life. So, um, and I had a lot of, you know, toys. So different things that could work into um, the garden. But you can see my little pine rockland plants here at the start. So this is where it ended up <clears throat> at the start of uh, rainy season in 2021. And I took a look at it and said, what do I want to do at the start of rainy season? Look how weedy that is, but it's great for butterflies. Um, and I definitely wanted to take out the crinum asiaticum. Um, and oh. also, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> can't read that. I'm doing a Zoom presentation sign. But um, I knew I wanted to take this out. And I had like, you know, last year was the, was the, um, I can't remember now, the, the lo locus um, uh, cicadas, they emerged. Well, I had the emergence of luber grasshoppers in my yard by the hundreds, um, just mind boggling. Um, by allowing this, one of their favorite food sources to grow and grow, 
was fed by this rainwater roof, uh, uh, rainwater off the roof here from the slope. It just got out of control and they hatched and oh my gosh, it was just like ridiculous. I was out there catching these things and smushing them. And I don't like to do that, but you can see what they do here in the lower corner. And of course I wrote a blog about it. So there you go, a little more. You can see I've been hacking away. I don't know, like some, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy, doing battle with these things with a machete. And you can see the rain garden starting to get better. Um, moved a second barrel, one of my cats there, IPA, pale ale. Um, and I started adding these little bits and pieces. Well, I've got broken pots and I've got these little globes. And then, you know, you saw the red lined kayak that we used at Arcola Lakes. Um, we had actually come up with that idea to make a vegetable garden during the year that the Super Bowl was going to be here um, because we had grants from NFL Greening to do different projects. So I'm like, oh yeah. And these are vases and um, wine bottles. <laughs> and yes, I ordered that. Oh, I've had that one for a long time. I ordered this one. One of my favorite pots got broken after Irma by the plumbers. They backed over it. You know, what can I do? And I had this leftover paint. This is one coat. The verdict is out on this color. Um, but I had this turquoise and blue and yellow thing going. It might be a little too much, but I'm waiting for this to all fill in again, as it will. This is how it looks now. I'm okay with this. I could do a little more neatening up. I could put some more um, pine bark nuggets here or pea rock. Um, it's okay with me that it doesn't look absolutely pristine. I don't expect it to because I know it's dry season and it's going to get even drier. So this is how it looked um, that first rainy season. You can see that the pickerel weed is bursting out of the seams. And Again, when I first got, it's starting to get chlorotic because there's not enough soil there. So there they are in the background in full purple glory. And a little bit of homage when I was looking at doing this last year, I found this on the internet, just a little curbside or elongated rain garden. Let me get to the plants. Yes. So for me, this was a little bit of want what you have, use what you got, a line from a book written by Jimmy Buffett. Yes, he writes books. He wrote books as well, um, but with some uh, caveats. And right plant, right place really, really comes into play here because you're going to need these aquatic edge plants. So these are the containers that I had because I have always loved every kind of plant you can think of. I have a cactus and succulent collection too, and many, many natives in that. So um, yeah, I had a lot of the right plants and we have these awesome publications and we've been watching, uh, of course, UF, we have all of these webinars during COVID that are available on a weekly basis. You can, you can hear experts. And this is talking about stormwater retention ponds. So this is standing water, but again, the level fluctuates. So what we're going to look at for a rain garden is not having the standing water, but we're in this zone. We're, we're kind of like the upslope um, and we may have just a, a day of standing water. So we can't do anything floating or submerged unless we're going to countersink something in there so that it holds that water. And this talks about aesthetics, function, and plant habit. So it's a great document. You guys can go and read that if you want to get into it. And then the venerable Dr. Gail Hansen, 
um, who's written so many great publications and does these wonderful drawings. Uh, we got to sit through one of her presentations uh, from Florida Friendly Landscaping's uh, monthly list of things, and I'll share that with you. So these are just some of the plants. I'm going quickly through it and the drawings. So giving you ideas of how to lay out the design if you're, if you're not so inclined that you want to do this yourself. So, and you guys saw this last week. If it's not native, my, what I would add, if it's not native, then it probably already is or will become invasive. And this is a look at through um, the South Florida Aquatic Plant Management Society. This presentation was done uh, by University of Florida was Lynn Geddes. Yeah, uh, Dr. Lynn Geddes. So she did this presentation and we looked at the same things that we went over, how the invaders got here, these guys here, they're not going to, uh, many of those invaders are right here from the big box store or emptying aquariums. And it really gets serious uh, when you start talking about aquatic edge plants or aquatic plants, invasive plants in aquatic environments, because you, what can you do? I mean, to resort to chemical control is not even feasible. And this is biological control. Here's the water hyacinth. Um, I want to say no, 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 no. Uh, it's been a problem for a long time here. We found out that it doesn't provide any nutrients for manatees either. So it's just something that's out of control here, out of its natural environment and, and the other plants and insects around that would normally keep it in check. So these are do not plant. I don't care how pretty they are or who gives them to you. Uh, my ex-husband gave me this for Christmas the year before last, and I bagged it up and put it in the dumpster. Sorry. So if you want purple, pick real weed. So let's get going. If I didn't know, like, all of this cool stuff about aquatic edge plants, because I'm a plant geek and a native plant geek, then if I live down here in this 10 county areas below Lake Okeechobee, this is where I would go, the Institute for Regional Conservation. And this is expanding, I hope soon for the entire state because this is like the dream database of native plants. I'm not kidding. So there's a little, uh, you can watch how it works. Sorry, also sharing uh, Jarrett Daniels, creating pollinator habitats in the built environment and I started to take that out, but guess what? That rain garden has plenty there for the butterflies. So first of all, habitats. When you're looking at what plants will grow, I always talk about, yes, you have the general list out of University of Florida in Gainesville, and it's writing about plants for the entire state of Florida. But with Institute for Regional Conservation, you can dial it in to your zip code or your county, and then you can dial it in by habitat um, because that zip code could contain areas that are dry as well as, as wet. But I would look at these different types of habitats that you can find within your area and look at the plant list for there. So this is the plant list you would get. And this is trees. If you can go a little further beyond that edge of the rain garden where you get wet, like you saw my garden flooded uh, last year, that would be a perfect place for Dehoon Holly. And it would feed the migratory birds that are all over my yard right now as well. So, I have already hymenus uh, latifolia, which the luber grasshoppers like to eat as well. And I don't, I can't really do this water lily unless I go ahead and, and put a container in there, but it's not going to be fed by, by rain unless they put it right under the roof overhang. But maybe, maybe I do that. So disturbed wetland. 
um, if you have a chance, just look at all the plants that are found in this environment. Keep in mind when these this list was um, done, this includes plants that are found in this environment that are both native, invasive, and rudeal. So you want to look at just the natives because those are the ones that you want. You do not want the invasives, of course. Um, and of course, our, my, lo my local chapter of Florida Native Plant Society, the Dade chapter, great website. And on this website, they just had forever and ever is where can you obtain those plants and where can you learn more about them. This is available. You can look at it right off the website or you can, um, you can download the PDF. And several of these like Pro Native Consulting at Silent Native holds a once a month open to the public uh, Saturday and Sunday by appointment during COVID. Um, you know, you can go in, the public can go to these nurseries as well. Some of these are wholesale, um, but you know, this is just an example. And then of course we have Fairchild uh, Connect to Protect and we have different events. Hopefully we're gonna be able to do them. Maybe no native plant day again this year, but um, that's always a great event because we have two or three vendors there selling native plants. Whew, I try to save up my money for that. <laughs> so trees, everyone, of course, when we're looking at that little river area, they went to Pond Apple. Uh, it's a major host for um, epiphytes, orchids and bromeliads attracts pollinators, but this tree is over planted in Miami-Dade County. Um, however, who can argue against being a host for the ghost orchid? Well, we haven't had ghost orchids in that area of Miami for a long time, but you can watch Chasing Ghost um, in the, the heart of the Everglades this is an outstanding video. Um, it's Audubon and National Geographic with three just fantastic um, explorers of the wild. And they identify the pollinator of the ghost orchid. I'm not gonna tell you, but that pollinator's larval host plant is also a native tree that we need to keep in our landscapes. So watch this be just in awe, it's like 15 minutes. So what I would instead try to plant is Sweet Bay. Um, it's our native um, mahogany, but I just can't find this down here. Um, and I might have to ask for seeds from somewhere. Um, it used to be, it's in the Everglades, um, in the wet areas of the Everglades. And why must I have this plant? Why must I have this small tree? Because it is the larval host of the tiger tail swallowtail. And I have yet to see one of these butterflies and very few people see them. I think you have to be in that um, wet environment deep in the Everglades. This one is a lawn weed. A lot of times when, when people are over irrigating their landscape, it's a little herb of grace and it is a larval host plant for the white peacock and it has just this beautiful little little white flowers on it they're sweet this is a whole patch of it i can't tell you where i saw it it's in one of our parks with natural areas and when i discovered that i was just like my jaw fell open and yes it made my day so there's the white peacock of course i'm always going to share the butterfly that it's a larval host for. And hopefully if you guys want, we can share this PDF. I got my hands on some iris and it's in a container on its own. And there you can see it where it was countersunk into the ground. Uh, this is when I lived in Miami Springs. So here I'm featuring porterweed, which is a good edge plant higher up because it doesn't like to be too wet. And also it needs to be in full sun all year to just really stay healthy. So there's the purple balls again. Um, 
Sagittaria lancifolia, I got this um, at Fairchild at the Plant Ramble. And it was being grown by, it was from Fairchild's own collection. So I was able to obtain it there to not collect from the wild. And there it is growing in a container before I started moving it over to my rain garden. And pickerel weed also got this from Fairchild um, Ramble from their own collection. And this is just your most incredibly beautiful purple. Um, it is a, a nectar source. I see dragonflies alighting on this for nectar. I see uh, little skipper butterflies on this all the time. And it's just amazing when it's in flower. And if you've ever gone across Payne's Prairie in the summertime, it's purple with pickerel weed. And a little um, kiss me quick is the name for this. And it, it, it since it's a succulent, it can take a little bit wet conditions, but it's a good filler plant to fill in between the rocks um, that you might use around the edge of your rain garden. And I got this at uh, Native Plant Day. I'm going to tell you, I got all of these pretty much from Native Plant Society <laughs> and um, uh, uh, frog fruit. It grows in the lawn. It'll pop out during rainy season. And also now many nurseries down here are selling this. Yay. So folks can buy it. And larval host for three different butterflies. Nectar for so, so many plants. There you go. And that's how small it is. I know I'm out of time. Fakahachi grass. Why this grass? Because it's a larval host plant. Of course, muley grass because it's beautiful. Blue eyed grass, be still my heart. And there it is growing in another red lined kayak. We painted orange for its gator orange. And I have to just go through. This is one of your rain lilies that is native that grows up in central and northern Florida roadside. And I just want to say, it's Valentine's Day on Monday. So instead of uh, buying flowers, which only last for a brief time, how about a native plant? I mean, violets are blue, roses are red. Um, there's a poem about this. And New York Restoration Project also talked about this. Skip the store, skip the florist. Sorry, guys, maybe they'll sell more native plants. Plant pollinator friendly perennials, I would say plant native pollinator friendly perennials. That's it. Flip my Florida yard, shout out to the, um, the villages chapter. You gotta watch this.